mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done that which is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was born into iniquity, and I have been sinful since my mother conceived me. desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear with joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain in me a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from death, O God, God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you have no delight in sacrifice. Were I to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrived heart, O God, you will not despise. Today we uh, wrap up our sermon series on forgiveness uh, by looking at forgiving ourselves uh, and using uh, Psalm 51 as the basis of that. And I've decided, you know, today that, that you know, obviously forgiveness is not a, uh, uh, it's a, it's a heavy kind of topic to be talking about. So I really appreciated that Boyd and Kelby helping us to see things on the sunny side of life, bring a little balance uh, to our worship today. Just a reminder that... Um, we have the book of forgiving. This is the book we've been basing kind of our sermon series on. And if you want to do more or you think about somebody that might need this in your life or family, I know we have a few left that uh, you could uh, use, take and purchase and mail them or get them to some people who might need it. Our next sermon series is during the season of Lent. And we're doing Adam Hamilton's uh, revival, Faith as Wesley Lived It. So we'll be looking at the uh, Wesleyan movement. Uh, John, John Wesley and his life and, and how that might impact us in our journey of Lent. As we know, Ash Wednesday begins the season of Lent and then Easter Sunday will be at the end of March the 27th. We'll have two guest speakers during this time. Our, dist our new district superintendent, uh, Roger Sparr, will be with us on Valentine's Day the 14th uh, to kick off our sermon series. And then two weeks later, uh, Randy Maddox, uh, who is a member of our annual conference, he's an ordained elder the United Methodist Church, and this is his home church. He used to teach at the Sioux Falls Seminary, and now he's at Duke uh, University, and there he teaches, and he's probably considered one of the premier Wesleyan scholars of our time, and he's going to come and be with us, and the exciting part is on Friday night and on Saturday morning, he's going to share in a series of lectures as well, and so we hope that you'll mark that on your calendar the very end of February, the last uh, Friday night, Saturday and then he'll be with us on Sunday. So I'm really excited about having him come and give us some insight into the, into the life and the story of Wesley as well as uh, incorporating uh, Wesleyan thought and Christian principles in our lives. Will you pray with me? 
Gracious God, we thank you on this journey that we've been together to think about what does it mean uh, to live a life and an ethic of forgiveness. We know that forgiveness always begins with you. And so today as we uh, summarize and uh, kind of come to some conclusions this day, we pray that you would speak to each of our hearts and uh, open us to the power of your spirit that guides us in our lives and our relationships and most importantly, our relationship with you. Be with us now, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Over the past year, there's been a new uh, show on PBS called Mystery, and it really uh, looks at the different stories of Sherlock Holmes, uh, those mystery events. And not long ago, there was one called The Case of the Dancing Men. And the show begins with a woman um, carrying a basket uh, of flowers, and she's looking at her and picking some of these flowers, when all of a sudden she sees uh, on the wall, kind of back, a rock wall, all of a sudden she sees pictures of dancing men. And it just freaks her out. She runs into her house. She goes into the bedroom. She slams the doors, locks the doors, closes the shades, and just screams and weeps. Her husband doesn't know what's going on and keeps asking her to open the door. And after a while, she finally comes out and explains that, uh, you know, her life, she thought, had been going very well and she was happy to be married to him, but that there was something in her past. And when she saw the figurines of the dancing men, it brought it all back. Something that she could never forget. Forgiving and forgiveness is a very important part of the Christian faith. We have uh, talked about it for the last four or five weeks. We began with, well, why do we forgive? Or why should we forgive? And we discovered that it's really God's idea. And in fact, God is the one who forgives you and I. In essence, which leads us to consider and think about, well, how do we forgive one another? As God forgives us. We learned from Jesus that we Forgive not just a limited amount of times of seven times, but 70 times seven, which really puts a challenge on us, doesn't it, to think about, well, how do I begin to incorporate forgiveness over and over and over again in my life and in my relationships? We've been using uh, this uh, particular piece from the book of uh, Forgiving. Because uh, Bishop Tutu tells us that each of us, there is a moment when we have to make a choice. That when we've been hurt or experienced some pain or a struggle in our lives, we choose. Do we choose to harm and go the revenge cycle to retaliate? Rejecting shared humanity, revenge, retaliation, payback, violence, cruelty. Or, as we have discussed, the forgiveness cycle, which is a fourfold path of choosing to heal. And by choosing that, then we tell the story of our experience. We name the hurt. We then grant forgiveness, recognizing that we are in a shared community, that all of us sin and fall short of God's glory. And then renew or release that relationship. Today, though, I also want us, uh, at, towards the end of the book, he talks about how we forgive ourselves. Because oftentimes when we talk about forgiveness, we talk about forgiving, you know, confessing to God and allowing God to forgive us. Or we talk about forgiving one another. But many times we do things, not only to ourselves or maybe to others, that we, we have a difficulty in forgiving ourselves. We have a difficulty in forgiving ourselves. Today we are looking at Psalm 51, and Psalm 51 is a psalm David wrote after he was found out. For you see, we know the story, David broke five of the Ten Commandments just in one experience. Here the king, the apple of God's eye, 
the one that seemed to have all of those blessings of God, broke God's heart. And in doing so, it was called out and discovered. David was so crushed that he penned this song. You know, the three hardest words to say in our lives is, I am sorry. It's hard for us to do, isn't it? I mean, there's something within us that says, well, you know, some way maybe I can get my way around this, or, you know. But it's difficult to say, I am sorry. They're the three hardest words to say, and David helps us to realize how to say them. This psalm is deeply heartfelt. He talks about a contrite heart. He talks about confessing. He talks about God cleanse me, wash me thoroughly, blot out my iniquities, my sins. David literally throws himself to the mercy of God's court because he knows he has done a deep wrong and a deep hurt. And so he begins in the place where it should all begin, reconciling himself to God, asking God for God's forgiveness, which then leads to his own forgiveness in his own life. You know, each week when we gather at this service, we have a prayer of confession. Uh, there was an adult Sunday school class in the church that sent a petition to the pastor and said, we want to get rid of the prayer of confession. And it listed the reasons. One is, well, we, you know, the prayer of confession is kind of negative, you know. And our children, you know, we want to give a positive image to our children about faith and life and the journey of life. We should just get rid of that prayer of confession because, you know, it's not very positive in our lives. But I think Psalm 51 reminds us today that confession is a part of our worship experience. Confession is an important part of our realization that we are not God and that we sin and that we fail and we make mistakes. And a critical part of that is confession. David's word of confession, of forgive me, O Lord, Blot out my sin, wash me, cleanse me, and renew me are words that we should incorporate into our lives as well. Because to begin the journey of forgiving others, we have to forgive ourselves. And most ultimately, we have to be then reconciled to God. Forgiveness, or forgiving ourselves, involves reconciling ourselves with God. Jimmy Carter ran against uh, Ronald Reagan in 1980 in the presidential campaign. There was a debate, and they were practicing at the same site, and Carter's practice was first, and so some of the notes that they had prepared for that rehearsal were left behind, and George Will, the columnist, who was a part of the Reagan campaign at that time, found the notes and he took them over. And so then the Reagan campaign kind of got a head start on what Carter was going to answer and what he was going to say. And eventually it all came out that George Will did that. Jimmy Carter said that in his heart he never really forgave George Will. He believed that was a turning point. And so he uh, went on with never following his column. He, he wouldn't read his books. He wrote a book about baseball. And uh, eventually, he was teaching in his Sunday school class. You know, President Carter has his Sunday school class he teaches every week. And they were talking about forgiveness. And he said, I was sitting there thinking about, well, who haven't, who haven't in my past have I really tried to do some reconciliation with? And his mind came to George Will. 
you know, well, I should probably write him a note, but I gotta think of something where I'm common ground. Well, I like baseball. I know he wrote a book about baseball. I know I refused to read it. So he went to the bookstore and he found it was for sale for a buck. So he went ahead and bought the book and he read it and then he wrote a note saying, I've been holding this, this pain in my life against you and I want us to move towards forgiveness. And then he got a nice note back from George Will saying, yes, I want to reconcile. My only regret is that you didn't pay full price for my book. You didn't pay full price for my book. Forgiving ourselves, the power of forgiving one another, it's a critical part of the journey of faith. Because, you know, friends, anyone can hold a grudge. It takes character to begin that path of reconciliation. To move beyond the sins of our own lives. To recognize that the sins of others are just as a part of the journey of life as well. And that we share in this shared humanity and that granting and offering and receiving and giving of forgiveness is how we live as Christian people. Create in me a clean heart, O God, is what David says. After this series in this particular passage of, of asking God for forgiveness, he invites God to create with him a new spirit. Frederick Buechner, the Presbyterian minister and author, Christian author, writes, when someone you have wronged forgives you, you are spared the dull and self-diminishing drop of a guilty conscience. When you forgive someone who has wronged you, you are spared the dismal corrosion of bitterness and wounded pride for both parties. Forgiveness means freedom again to be at peace inside your own skin and to be glad in each other's presence. It's been my prayer that through this journey we have deepened our walk with one another in our community in recognizing that forgiveness is a critical part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. We've seen it in this passage from Psalm 51 in King David. We've seen it in Jesus' conversation in the Gospels over and over again of mercy and compassion. We've seen it in the Apostle Paul as he was dealing with the church at Corinth. Throughout the scriptures, we see the places where God's mercy and compassion and forgiveness is then celebrated among the, the people of God, practiced and shared. Now we know that there are probably those daily moments when you have to just say I'm sorry and you know those incidental moments where we bump into one another and you know that part of the forgiveness is there but it is also our prayer that we would begin to examine our, our life in the places where we maybe need to release some things, to renew some relationships, to release some relationships so that we, people of forgiveness, can be a part of the core experience of peacemaking. Powerful peacemaking with God, with ourselves, with our neighbors and friends. The Scottish proverb, you know, you've heard it said, confession is good for the soul, but really the proverb is open confession is good for the soul. So may we practice that's art of forgiveness, that power of confession that would help us and free us to truly be people of peace. Now, many of you know, I, I didn't grow up United Methodist. I grew up Missouri Synod Lutheran. And uh, when I was growing up at worship, after the sermon, it's interesting enough, part of the liturgy was singing uh, the response to this particular song. We sang it every week. I remember learning it when I was a little boy in worship. And, and it's really kind of carried me in my life, my spiritual life, and my relationships. And it goes like this. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, 
and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Let us pray. It's hard, Lord, to forgive. It's hard to forgive ourselves. And yet we know that this is your idea. Because of the powerful grace and mercy that we discover in and through your son Jesus Christ, through his death and resurrection, we are truly your chosen people. So today, create in us a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within each of us that we may truly be your disciples who offer forgiveness, who experience forgiveness, who set ourselves on a path and a journey of living, living peacefully with you and with one another. For we ask this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen.